Welcome to Emotional Intelligence Simplified. This is a weekly podcast focused on demystifying and discussing what emotional intelligence is. Demystifying what emotional intelligence is has become the main agenda for Profiles International as they continue in their quest to molding cultures. This podcast seeks to explore the everyday story through the lens of emotional intelligence. We discuss the key elements of emotional intelligence that allows people to connect with others, collaborate effectively, and make more effective decisions, whether at the workplace or in our personal lives. Join us as we explore with our guests the elements of emotional intelligence and other key areas such as well-being, creating safety in your area of influence, growing each day in resilience, and so much more. I am Angela Muhaki, an emotional intelligence practitioner and coach, and also a professional mediator and broadcaster. Today on Emotional Intelligence Simplified, we are talking to Mary Kindia, who is an ICF professional coach, a leadership trainer, and an emotional intelligence practitioner. She has had a 35-year career serving in corporate sector, public sector, non-profit, and as an international public servant. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Mary. I'm glad to be here. So let's start with uh, just because. Before they go Googling, who exactly is Mary? If you are asked to say, describe yourself, who's Mary? Oh my goodness, there's so many things. Because one of the things when I'm coaching or even training women, I actually ask them, let's take a book out and write, who am I? Mm-hmm. And we start with mother, partner, friend, professional, boss, and all those things. But I think um, somebody who loves to help people explore their full potential. Mm. And I say what I do bring, my value proposition is that I bring clarity to big ideas. And how I do that, whether it's through training, it's through coaching, it's through emotional intelligence, I just hope that my little mark in the world is that I really help people realize who they are, maximize their potential. And this is really bringing clarity to the big Mm. ideas. People say after speaking with me, they say, I get it, now I know. I know exactly what I want to do because speaking with me I'm able to bring that clarity and help them untangle the webs that are usually in our thoughts. So that's really who I am. Absolutely. I agree. She has mentored me. So yes, she does bring clarity to the many things that are running up and down in your head. You're not too sure how to tame them down. Now, I like what you said. You help them live their full potential. So let's talk about how does one live up to their full potential? Hmm. In a number of ways, but I think the very first one is... I don't think one can leave their potential unless they know what they want. Mm -hmm. And this is something I think we all struggle with. Even now in my 60s, I keep saying I'm on the sixth floor. You will always have different goals and different things you want to do. And I think I'm actually at the point right now, I'm struggling with what do I really want now to, to do, to accomplish or to be. So I think to maximize your potential, wherever you are in the stage of life, you've got to know what is it that you want to do? What is your goal? What is your plan? What purpose do you see for yourself at that moment doing? Once you know that, and you can aim for the stars or aim just below the stars or aim for the sky, but it's actually really necessary to have that goal. When we're in school, we know I want to go and do my, I don't know what it's called now, but uh, you know, when you finish standard, standard something and you go into high school, yes, I want to get to high school. So the goal is I need to get to high school. So during primary, you're working very hard to get the best marks and to go to the best high school. I want to go to a national high school. So you really maximize your potential in learning to get to that top national high school. When you get to high school, oh, I want to get to university. I must go to university. It's even sharper and better if you know what you want to do in university. Mm -hmm. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to be something. So I think it's so important to know what is it that I want? Where do I want to be? And then that helps you maximize that potential to get there. Maybe you're a young girl or a young man. I want to get married. I want to have a family. Then you maximize your potential to get that thing that you want. So I think it's very difficult for me, especially, to separate potential from goal because I think the two are tied. They go together. Yeah. So let's let's flip it. How do you know you're not living your full potential? <laughs> 
Is it because, you know, because sometimes we have goals, like you say, and they keep shifting. And I'm glad to know that uh, this changing of goals is something will happen. It is a continuous thing as long as you're alive. So how do I then make sure, how, how will I know I'm not living to my full potential? Well, one, if you have a goal, what are the steps that get you to that goal? I, is there progress? Mm -hmm. And I think the word um, success comes from the Latin word successus or something close to that. Okay. And that means in Latin is, is progressive steps. Mm -hmm. So are you making those progressive steps to reach that goal? to that potential that you can look, get to. And the funny thing is when you get to that potential, then you get another goal. Uh -huh. you, you keep moving. Yeah, you keep moving. You say, oh, no, this is not enough. Oh, I've reached uh, this profession. Now I want to be senior counsel. Or I've reached uh, Kilelesha. Now I want to live in Runda. So there's always, when you reach that goal, you always get more because of that experience you have. So I think that is one of the things you can know. Am I living to my potential in the steps I'm taking to get to that goal? Mm -hmm. And once I get to that goal, am I just now dithering and living there? Or am I having another stretch goal. Then the second thing is, are you stretching yourself? Okay. Because if you're really comfortable, nothing worries you, then you're really not living your opportunity because I'm eating well, nalala kemali pazuri. So there's that, yes, you, it's necessary to be comfortable, but it's also as human beings, we always like that challenge, that stretching of yourself. So if you're too comfortable, you need to wake up. You know you need to wake <laughs> up and know that. There's, there's really, what more can I do? What more can I reach? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I'm, I'm at the stage of where I'm feeling so relaxed. I'm, I'm relaxed with my weight and it's overweight. I'm relaxed with my business. Yes, it's not giving me all the financial autonomy I want. And I know I'm not maximizing myself. When I'm not f stretched, when I don't feel tired, I had a great day of work and I feel really tired, but I feel fulfilled. If you're not getting that sense of God today, I had a hard day, but I accomplished this and I did it and we started it so difficult and you feel that thrill, then you know you're not realizing. And that's why we look for thrills elsewhere. Ah, either in sport or yes. with friends going out or drinking because you still want that challenge, that sense of fulfillment that I've done something. And that excitement of life, sometimes we misdirect it. At least I do in my life. <laughs> so from what you're saying, it sounds like you must be intentional. Aha, uh -huh. absolutely. That is the word. Intentional. So it's not that life is just, life is happening to you. In fact, I say you have to be so intentional in everything that I do. And though many of my people who know me, either they've been clients or people I've worked with or, or um, you know, sort of been in associations together, like my full circle with Mary, is I'm always saying you have to be very intentional in everything that you do because you're working towards something. Mm -hmm. um, intentional in how you dress, intentional with what you say, intentionally um, creating networks and relationships. Be intentional because if you're not intentional, then why are you wasting all this effort? There's only 24 hours in a day. Use it intentionally so that you don't come to regret it. I know we all waste it. I do too. But in the things that you can, be as intentional as possible because you want that progressive step towards something. So how can I be, how can I maximize on my being, you know, intentional? If I've just heard it today for the first time and I've, I haven't understood it, what would you tell me to do? Okay. I want to go to town yes. tomorrow to do something. Okay. It's still a thought. How intentional are you about going? What time do you want to go? What time do you want to get there? How do you want to do it? How do you want to look? How do you want to be a peer? It isn't something you want to go tomorrow and then you decide the whole day, ah, nita decide zanga pinta mukanta enda. That's not being intentional. But if you say, I'm going to go to town at nine o'clock or at 10, so I'll get up and do these things and then I will intentionally arrive early. So I need to catch the 7 a.m. bus to be there early. That's being intentional. Just deciding to let it come when it comes, that I wake up and then when I decide to go, you're not intentional about it. It can be as simple as that. Or you can be very intentional that I want to create a certain image of myself. How do I dress? Mm -hmm. How do I dress my hair? How do I dress myself? How do I appear? Am I clear of how people perceive me? And that's being self-aware to be aware that because I want Angela to like me. I want where we are, this great place called Sema Box, to like me. I want to create a relationship with them. How intentionally do I appear when I talk to them, when I greet them? Because people make first impressions based on how you appear. So being very intentional about how I present myself is really key. I like how we've organically grown into this. So let's talk about dressing and appearance. How important is it? And let's start with you and the white thing. I know you strictly dress in white. What motivated you? How did we get there? 
Wait, wait. Uh, let me say this. I've had a journey with colors. When I was first in the oil industry, um, I was the first in everything. First woman executive, first woman officer, first woman CEO, first woman this, first woman expatriate. I was so keen on how I'm perceived. So I used to dress very, you know, corporate, very professional, black and white, navy, blue. I look like a lawyer. <laughs> and then I wasn't aware of how I was coming up to others. I had a very male kind of drive to everything. I want to be like the man. I want to sit at the table. I want to smoke on the table with the, the ministers, the price negotiation. I wanted to be the same. I'm just as good, working just as hard and 16 hours a day. And then I went into as an expert to the UK. And I started relaxing into my own skin. And I went to a color consultant because I realized people dress differently. Some dress very casual, but they're still very senior. You don't, the dress doesn't make you as it were. It is part of how you bring your whole persona into that. So when I went to a color consultant, I actually found what colors were good for me. Mm -hmm. And I started wearing purples and reds. And I really realized my femininity was part of me. And in fact, if I were to show up in a gentler way than that merry, tough bitch kind of lady, I was more acceptable. Because much as I tried, I cannot be a man. No. I was a woman trying to be a man, dressing like a man, talking like a man. But that I wasn't aware of how I was being perceived and received. Mm -hmm. So I actually relaxed into myself and I loved that. But as I got older, we went for this photo shoot with, um, I think you know, how can I forget her name? Um, anyway, I remember her name. I went for a shoot of the of the women in their 50s. Yes, the coffee book. Yeah, the coffee book. Mm -hmm. And women in their 50s. And we were told to wear pop white. And then they had another photo shoot of us wearing purple. You know, there's that poem about when I get old, I shall wear purple and, you know, sit yeah. on the street and spit and all that. So they had all these wraps for us. I had never worn white. My best color was black. But we went into Bobby Pearl Photographer's shoot studio and we were photographed in white. I realized how beautiful white is for older women. And I really felt like I came into my own. And because I love simplicity, I follow, I, you know, one of the disciplines uh, by this book by Foster about the spiritual disciplines, I love the, dis the, the discipline of simplicity. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And I realized, actually, in life, we have a sort of a uniform that defines us, particularly for women leaders. People define you by how you dress. And if you want to remove the topic of how you look and dress, mm -hmm. build a uniform into it. And if you look at Hillary Clinton, you look at the Queen the late queen. Yeah, there were certain colors she only no, wore. No, she wore this, the dress with the, the dress coat. Yes. She could change any color and she had a different set of colors. If you look at Margaret Thatcher, the suit. If you look at uh, Angela Merkel. So what you're doing is you're removing the, the perception of what you look, who you are because of your dress. If you look at Monica Juma, the way she dresses. If you look at Amina Mohammed with the scarf, you are very deliberate. Because even the suit is a uniform. Mm. And men have that suit which equalizes everybody. So you've got to remove people talking about who you are. Oh, angalia your hairstyle. Lea mituvalia nini. Akona dressi. Create a uniform that creates stability and that you remove that discussion of your body and yourself and they look at your content. And that's why I realized white is a fantastic color. It becomes me. It's lovely for older women. If you look at all these uh, women, you know, in cities, particularly in the sun. So I have two colors. I wear black or I wear white. Sometimes I'll have black and white, but I just feel it's very comfortable. And let me tell you, it's so inexpensive. Mm. I can wear the same white shirt three times a week. <laughs> Nobody comments on it. I can wear the same white trouser. And this, so I have a very small wardrobe, but because I wear white all the time, nobody now gets into Mary's wearing that dress. How does she look in that? Does that suit her? What's the fashion? It's simplicity at its best. And I absolutely love it. The other thing is, People make the, the first impression. Did you know that 55% of the impression is made on visual, what we see? People make up their minds just like that. On how you're dressed. On how you're dressed. It can take from a tenth of a second to a maximum probably um, 30 seconds on how you're dressed. 55% of it. Another 38 is when we hear your first words. So 93% is made up from how you look. Dressing and voice. And just voice. And then 7% is now what you say, the verbal. People have already wow, they've made... decided even before they've listened to the content. Absolutely. And that first impression la lasts a long time. It takes a long while to change it. And look at, it's the same as everything. Look at this building. We walked in. It says professional. So we start thinking, wow. And we'll pay the price because they look professional. The place is clean. 
if you go to cities, Dubai, you go to New York, you go to wherever, how, cities want to appear their best to attract so they're clean. They present themselves in the best light. They have color coding. So impression is very important. And it's what then determines, do I want to interact with you? Do I think you're somebody who has something of value to say before you've even said the first words? So how do we then dress? Like I, I like how you've explained the with the colors that you get to a point where you, you know, even using the leaders, where we stop looking at the femininity and we focus on the content. So if I'm trying to make an impression, and so, so if you advise people like us, what would, how should I dress then? Because yes, I want to take away, forget how I look, listen to my content. If, if 35% is, is it 50%? 55. 55% is just on impression. How do we create that balance? And that impression is not only dress, it is smile. It's whether you're polite, your eye contact, are you looking at the person? So mm. it's, it's, it's more than just the dress, but the dress is very important. So I say, and the, the fact, at one time at the female leadership group we did, and I continue to do FKE, we had actually brought in um, what we're calling basic essentials for people to understand their body size and to understand their body shape. So there's body shape and there's body size. Everything is possible, but what is your body shape? Are you an apple? Mm. Are you a, you know, a, pair. Are you a pair? Are you a column? Are you, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, are you pear, you know... Are, there's so many different ones. So understanding how you dress your body is very important because you want to accentuate it, not bring attention to the parts that you don't want attention to. But also having a smile on your face, it is so, so important. Because then you're open, you're saying, I'm open, and I see you looking at people's eyes. Sometimes people don't understand that looking at people's eyes, if you can't look at the eyes, look between the brow, and if you can't do that, <laughs> look at the hairline. When I, when I prep people for interviews, I say, look at the hairline, because mm -hmm. then they will think you're looking at them. Because eyes are like the, you know, the... The windows to the soul. Absolutely, windows to the, to the soul. So I really think that um, you have to... Appearance speaks to who you are and what you are. So it's important to be conscious that your body language... When I'm speaking to you and you've got your hands closed like this, and I'm just looking away, what is your body language telling me? That I you're don't want to hear you. Exactly. Or I'm not comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not even interested in what you say. If I slouch on my chair, I go for an interview. So it's really important to sit up and see what my body language is saying, what my appearance is saying, what my smile is saying, what my eyes are looking at you. We're smiling at each other, and it just enhances our connections as human beings. So people experience you as being present. And so present that I've even taken care of my body, of my the way I dress, so that I'm not bringing attention to take away from our content and relationship and not be looking at that cleavage or how <laughs> tight it is around my stomach. I have a big stomach. So make sure I don't bring attention to that. Or these dresses, they're called bandage dresses. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The African, contours. The contours that we African women think that's are what we should be outdoor. wearing. I mean, look, these things are made for another body shape in Europe and another age. How do I best present myself and be aware that I want people to focus on me, my character, what I do, what I bring to the table, my value proposition, and not my appearance. So I'm just hearing here self-awareness, self-awareness, self-awareness. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we need to learn to focus, understand, like you said, understand who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's really, that is a lesson we really need to look and at. And I understand I am a 65-year-old, overweight African woman. I wish... Please look for her photos. She's not <laughs> overweight. She looks fantabulous. She's a beautiful, glowing woman. 65, 65, if that's what 65 looks like, man, it looks good. Thank you. So let's look at um, some of the things that uh, we were thinking about in life. You know, like as we're talking about attaining and finding that space, what is the difference between growing up and giving up? Hmm, interesting question. I think... I think growing up is learning. It is, whether it is learning through school or materials um, in whatever way, or it's active learning through life, through experiences. Through experiences, yeah. Because something happened to me, so I learned. Like when a child touches fire mm -hmm. and they are burnt and they don't have to be told by mm -mm. their mother, do not touch again. So we can learn by 
other people sharing their experiences. We can learn from books. We can learn from school. We can learn from how, how you and I have become emotional intelligence practitioners by going to study it and then be certified in it and then continue to practice it because yes. it's no good learning without practicing it. But there's also our own physical experiences. And I think our own f- experiences are the biggest that shape us, how I grew up, um, what I did in, you know, and other people mentoring me and so on. So I think for me that, and then developing. So it's learning, it's maturing, and then it's developing out of that. If you don't develop through that learning that taught you or through that experience, you can have all the experiences, but if they don't teach you anything, you know, you're really not growing up. You know, like how you like this uh, expression I use a lot at home that, you know, um, the Swahili say, as your funzo na azaz at a funzo na dunia. Yes. So it is that dunia that will teach you and help you learn if you don't learn it before. Well, what we call here uh, these days character development. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it's called. Well, well, if, 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 if sometimes life teaches you the lessons. Eh, but slap kidogo. Eh, that one. Eh, 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 kidogo, character development. Character development. So I think to me that is growing up. However, giving up is something I feel so sad about because I think that when you give up is loss of hope. When people don't have hope, and hope I checked, you know, hope is kind of a feeling of expectation and desire mm. in something you want to happen. Mm. I want to grow rich. I want to make it. I want to get a degree. I want to marry. I want to have children. If you give up that hope, if you have no hope, then you've given up. And I think that bad things in life happen when people give up. And I get very scared, like in our country, if we don't fix the issues of in- inequalities, of income, of unemployment, of our youth, the day they give up, and we've seen that in other countries, yes. that's when they have nothing to lose and bad things can happen. Even if you build the biggest walls in our estates to live beautifully with a wall and a guard and a whatever, those people are so many more than us. There's so many more than the security forces. So I think that hope is the thing that keeps us from going over the edge. So when people give up, that's when you hear Somebody's committed suicide. They don't bother. You You don't get out of bed. And I've been there sometimes during COVID. I wouldn't get up for three days. You asked me when I last showered. I don't know. Okay, I've become better. So I don't shower every day. I'm at home online. But they're giving up where you just don't want to get out of bed. You don't see the Everything, sense of, there's no hope. You're yeah. just feeling, why? why? Why bother? Why bother? Why should I even put deodorant? Why should I clean myself? I have no chance. And when you give up, whether it's on a marriage, whether it's on getting children, having a relationship, making it in a career. I've seen people in careers give up and they have such potential to do well but they've been sat on so much they have a boss who bullies them people don't see them they give up and i'm telling a given up person you can just see it they lose self-confidence they dress funnily they don't even want to get lift they say no no you let the lift go up they don't want to go with everybody else because they see themselves so small and that's actually what happens when you have bad leaders that squash the, the ambition, potential. the potential in somebody, and they destroy your self-confidence. And those people, honestly, every time you talk to them, they are just jumping. Eh? They're they on edge. Hear you. You're on edge. You, They're even... expecting yeah. the worst. Exactly. And that is the worst to see when I sit down to another human being by somebody else. And that's why I really say emotional intelligence is something we should say. Everybody who's supervising somebody, just mm. one person. First, you need it for yourself. But to... even if you don't need it for yourself, at least how to... I'd help other people and be self of others because you can only maximize their potential and help them be confident and grow by your behavior. Okay, what would we term as this uh, scenario I'm going to give you? I'd rather it's giving up mm. or it's growing up. As we said, as you get older and, and, and life teaches you that maybe I had expectations, but uh, I have to understand that it's not going to happen. I'm never going to be mm. a size one. So have I given up or have I, have I grown up? You see, the, sometimes it's hard to distinguish where you look at your limitations and you decide these are my limitations or you feel you have limitations and, and that's what's holding you back. Is that growing up, being realistic or is it giving up? I think it's being realistic. I think it's focusing on defining realistic goals. When our kids are young, they tell you, oh, I want to be president. Mm, oh, they want, want to do everything. <laughs> yeah, be like Michael Jackson. You know, I have young kids myself. They're, in, uh, they're young adults. They think you'll be a influencer, I'll be this. But as you grow and you learn <laughs> and you mature, you realize what is a realistic goal. So there's this book actually written by Shane Lopez. She's an author of saying, making hope happen. And she said, let me give you a quote. She says, hope is fueled by optimism. And they believe that you have the power to make 
positive changes in your life. Mm -hmm. But she also goes on to say, focus on defining realistic goals. You and I know people who have such goals and you look at them, you're like, <laughs> okay, uh, I hear you. Yes, but. but. So if you have an realistic goal, then really you're not focused on reality. So you will, you will get disappointed. And when you give up, you will get bitter. Mm. But if you say, okay, what's the first thing we can do? And that's what in coaching or even emotional intelligence we do. We say, okay, what can you do now? Yes. What are the options available to you now? Mm. What do you need to do to get that? And then define, okay, that's a way forward. If you meet that goal, let's do another one. Okay, now how do we move from that one to another one? But sometimes, particularly with these young people, I see them wanting to start the, to climbing the tree from the top. Yes. Eh, to yeah. the tree, to the top ones I love to tajua. But... It's that realism that is really necessary, I think. I like how this automatically leads to the next question. Then how do we live to our full potential? <laughs> you know, so let's start with the realistic goals. And you've talked also about hope. And I like the element of hope that hope is tied to positive thoughts mm. and realistic. So they have to mm. be smart. Mm. Uh -huh. So how do we get to live to our full potential? Ooh. I think first is... Developing that goal. That what goal you again. Want? You what see how I we want? keep coming back to yeah. the goal? Yeah. So life is about goals. It's about goals. It's about plans. What do I want? Yes. And like I say in the female future program, sometimes we ask, and I know, sometimes I'm asked and I don't know. I ask people, what do you want? What do you see yourself uh, in, within the next five years? What do you want? What is sometimes you can't see? You can't see. You say, I just want to be successful. Yeah. I want to okay. be happy. Yes. And I say, what does success look like for you? Uh-huh. Because sometimes we have very big words, but what does success look like? Is success 500,000 shillings a month? Is success 200,000 shillings a month? Is it 50,000? Is success a big house? Is success seeing my kids, if I finished the schooling for them? So define very specific outcomes, like being smart, you know, smart, you know yes, specific, smart. measurable, time-bound, realistic actions that you can take. So cut it up and say, okay, I want within the next, like for me now, one of my goals is I need to move out of Nairobi and move to Nyanyuki in my own little land with my own little bungalow. Oh. That is now my target. So that's where you're headed. Yes. And I've been talking about it too long. I have a PhD in procrastination, but I will do it. I think I have a, <laughs> two degrees, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we see we're aware. We're self-aware, but now I really need to put it into action. So I've already started. I've looked at land. I'm looking at land. And, um, the, but the first thing is move there in a rented accommodation. And then get the house looking. done. Then get the plot, then get the house. It will take a few years. So really to get to my full potential is understanding what do I want yes. in the next 12 months, it's six months, two years, define what you want. Cause a goal is key. Don't mm. flounder about like I've been floundering since pandemic. And then think of, do I have that mindset, have that growth mindset that I can achieve this? Cause it's realistic. And then reflect on it. Every time you do action, reflect on it and focus on the big picture. Even if you fall down, the big picture is to move to Nyanyuki. That is so where we want to that's go. That's where we want to go. So have, you know, have those small steps that help you go there. And I always say, have a group, have connections and relationships around you that can help you keep you on that path. If you have relationships, there are people who can actually help you be able to move so that you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're using the things that you need to do and practicing discipline. For me, discipline is the worst one. If I can, if I can hack discipline, I think I would even be more successful. I've not yet been able to hack discipline. I want to get up at six, walk at a boratum every day. I'll manage two, three times a week and not. But trying to make sure you're focusing on, on discipline, to me, that will be the signs that I'm moving. Do you have, and celebrate your small successes. If you do this, celebrate yourself. Because sometimes we're too hard on ourselves and mm. then we give up mm. because we're not celebrating the little steps that we're taking. So if we learn to celebrate our little successes. Acknowledge them, mm -hmm. own them. I think that's a, maybe that, 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 would that, be. that may help. Yes, that would help. That would help me. I'm, 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 I've decided to internalize. I've thought of my battle with procrastination and yes, getting there, that is, wow, I really like this. Now, so let's talk about risk. You know, I am risk averse and, and it's a big problem. I have to accept it now. I'm those people who, hey, we're going where? To Mombasa. How are we going? When are we going? What's plan B? What if, what if, what didn't? And I think it's held me back for a very long time because of the fear of the unknown. But risk is, is important in life. So what is the role of risk? 
I think I'm not the right person to ask. I think they say that most women, and I think sociologically or the way we were made, created is that, yes, women are generally averse to risk while men are not. They're just jumping. Yes, and I think it's the way they culturize it, but also we are the naturalists, we are the blenders. So we don't risk because if you risk, you're risking with your children whom you're nursing, who you're looking after, whilst men have, you know, we have a near-term vision, they have that long-term vision and they're able to risk. Um, I know people say that you'll never grow if you don't take risks, but in a sense, we all take risks because we have to. When we go to a new high school, we're taking a risk trying to build new friends. When you change jobs because I'm not doing so well, you're taking a risk. You don't know if the new job, yes, if told you the salary, but you don't know if, if you'll succeed or not. Mm. So we do take risks every day without knowing. When you decide to marry person X, <laughs> you're taking a risk. You it have is. no idea whether this thing is going to work or not. But based on the facts that you have at the moment, you do. If you decide to have a baby, particularly for women, you're taking a risk. You could die at childbirth. And it happens whether so they go to a good hospital or not. So I think we all take risks all the time. I think the thing is that perhaps we don't do well, and I don't do well, but I try and improve is if you're going to take a risk, do all your homework, what would call due diligence. I've so been on the calculated boards risk. Because mm -hmm. I'm on boards, actually risk is a big thing, particularly when you're working on boards with banks, boards with financial institutions, where in fact the, the, the regulators, you know, has... You I have certain stringent yes, rules. rules about risk and how you mitigate risk and so on. For I think the thing is, is think of ourselves like a company. I'm always telling company people, you're you're Angela Muhaki PLC. Okay. Think of you're the income earner for all your other roles. Angela, the daughter, the sibling, mm. the the you know, what you're calling the ATM for your relatives. <laughs> What, you know, how do you mitigate risk is think of the due diligence. Do How well do I know this person if you're getting married? Okay. Investigate them. Check it out. Look for red flags. So in anything you're going to do, just open the box. I think we think of it's a big box and I don't want to open it. It's like a Pandora's. So if you're saying people want to go to Mombasa, say, okay, what are the risks? If we fly, what are the risks? There is the pandemic. You remember, I could take flights. And yeah. We'll get, we'll get virus in the air. <laughs> it was okay. flood. If we drive, which kind of car do we drive? Do we get a driver or not? We don't want people getting tired. Yeah. What time is the best safe time? So just investigate all that and then say, how do we mitigate them? I mitigate them by having a qualified driver, making the car goes for service. I'll mitigate by doing this. So how do you mitigate against that risk? And then say, I've done all I can. The rest is Julia Mungu. I have to do it. But I think by leaving it in a box and it not breaking it down, and that's, I think that's, that's what clarity. drives the fear. Yeah. Exactly. So, so break, open it up. Open it up and say, okay, what am I fearing? I'm fearing A. I'm fearing B. I'm fearing if I go into this relationship, what would happen? Okay, break it up. And then say, okay, if that were to happen, then do I have a job? Do I have a bank account? If it were to fail, do I have a means of supporting myself? Exactly. So once you start looking at the detail, it's not so hard. And that's why I think I love being a coach, even an emotional intelligence practitioner, because I help people bring clarity to that big idea, that big risk, that big thing you're fearing. Let's break what are the parts in it and then what can you do about each? If you have mitigated the most you can, then go forward. Because if you, if we don't take those risks to change jobs, to stop doing, like when I, I, I had no, I, I stopped working to get a salary in November, 2012. Wow. So it's was, 10 years. 10 years. I was so scared because I always thought I always needed a job all my life. I was schooled for the cattle rank of going to employment jobo. And I just knew how to be employed. Mm. And when I left UNEP and I just said, fine, I'm not going to get a job. I don't want a job. I'm so tired of being somebody else's, you know, um, employee or mm. staff. And I remember one day I just woke up and said, oh, goodness, I haven't had a job for five years and I'm still alive. Time had flown that fast. Time had flown that fast. Wow. Because I've been called to do a consultancy, I've been called to go on a body, I've been called. So I remember thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to pay my rent? But I, I think because I was so tired of being employed, I just took that risk. So it wasn't all courageous, but I was a bit tired and I just couldn't see myself. And now, as I'm in saying sixth floor, i am now got new fears. I'm wondering, how the hell am I going to relocate and leave somewhere? I, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you that question when you talk about risk. Here you are telling us you're going to Nyanyuki. So now we have to be planning road trips. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're in the bundus in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Luckily, I've checked my risks. Nyanyuki <laughs> is a cosmopolitan term. I, 
And we always went there when we were young. I ah, had okay. two aunties married to my uncles, but I always felt those uncles were more uncle to me than my aunties who are my mom's sisters, one in the army and one in the air force. Mm. So we used to go there a lot when we were young. The one married into the army is still there. She has a big farm. My cousins are there. I've always loved Nanyukisa. It's very, it's very urban. Yes. Yet it's not. And it's got a mixture of all the people, white, Indians. Everyone. Everyone. There's a club. And there's a nice atmosphere. There's a very nice atmosphere. It, there's no mud. You know this Doro, mud thing <laughs> that I hate of, of rural areas. No, I just tell you, go and it's rained and you'll see. I have been there with, when this Doro. Where? Where? Well, off the tarmac road. Off the tarmac road. But, you know, in Nanyuki town, because for it's me, clean, my, yeah. my home home area is Karatina, and where we used to go, it was always used to be Doro. <laughs> so it is not that Doro when it rains, nobody can go anywhere. And I just love it. So I've been now checking who's there. I've got friends. I've got people I know. And luckily, almost of my work is 90% online. There's a nice club. Um, I live with my seven-year-old mom. So I'm thinking, if I can be online in Nairobi and I don't get out of the house for two weeks, it's the same thing. It's the same UK. thing? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Now, how much do feelings determine our full potential? Everything. Everything. Feelings are everything. Everything. Feelings are the base. Feelings are data. Like now I'm feeling thirsty. Where's my coffee? We will work on this data. <laughs> I'm feeling hungry. Let me go and eat. I'm feeling lost. I mean, yeah, I'm feeling lost. So that tells me, then what can I do to find myself? Mm -hmm. I'm feeling connected with this person, with Wangela. So I connect with her and I relax and I can share my life as I'm sharing now. If I didn't feel that feeling of connection that I'm safe with you, I wouldn't be able to talk. Yet I know this is a podcast that will go out to millions of people. Mary, what are you saying? So feeling is our emotional brain, which we all have as a human being, which is our, you know, primary the amygdala is part of us and feeling tells us whether we it's um it's a threat or it's a reward so how do we manage them because sometimes they can lead us in the right or the wrong direction how do we create that balance we create that balance by being very aware of them remember you told me about that word intentional you're very intentional and trying to create a space between the feeling and the action so if we're able to say i am feeling this then do I act immediately or do I try and create, as it were, some time gap so that I can think about that feeling and then make a decision based on that thinking? Because what happens is that, and as you know, as emotional intelligence practitioners, we have that amygdala brain, the, prim the what are they called, the primitive the brain. The primitive brain, yes. Is what takes care of us. But we have the frontal, you know, the prefrontal cortex where is our thinking brain. The thing is, you feel the emotion first. But if you can, as much delay as you can, whether it's two seconds, three seconds before you react, to allow thinking to kick in, and then whether whatever you've said, I don't react to it. I say, oh, okay, many am jinga. Okay, breathe in. One, two, three. Okay, what's the best way to react? I say, okay, I hear you. What makes you think I am mujinga? Mm. Instead of saying, I don't react. Mujinga. Yeah, and you start bringing in relatives. Yeah, I just <laughs> enter where I am mujinga. Then what happens? The whole thing becomes Explodes. volatile. Yeah. So in emotional terms, we say try and create what we. I there's an article I read. It's called Mind the Gap. Yeah. Because in London, in the tube stations, you always have when you come into a tube station. Some of the tube stations, the platform and um, where not. the train ends as you step off, are not. Um, aligned. Aligned. So yeah. there's actually a, quite a gap. And if your foot goes into it, that's it. You're dead, half dead anyway. So you go into like Victoria Station and that's it. they say, mind the gap. Mind the gap. And it keeps on saying that to, you know, to allow... To you, remind the To passengers. remind the person as you get out, there's a gap. Your foot may fall in and step out knowing that, you know, you have to make an extra bigger step. So this article talks about leaders or anybody who wants to be emotionally aware, things will happen to you and mm. your feelings are very important. But how are you so aware to the self degree that you're managing yourself and managing this um, emotion? If you're in a negotiation table and things are going south and you can see the tone of this person, the body language is aggressive. What do I do? Remove yourself, go to the bathroom, wash your face, kidogo, or breathe and come back. So that you, you see, most times we want to do something, we want to influence people to get my goal. If I react, it's not going to achieve my goal. No. So the best way to influence you is to be very self-aware, to not react so that I do the wise thing because it's not just good for me, it's for my staff, it's for everybody else. But that is very difficult to do. I know it's, it's We need say. strength and grace for that. <laughs> oh God, give me grace, give Hallelujah. me grace. Particularly in family meetings, give me grace. 
Uh, that yeah. one, I don't know if I third it or I fourth it, Kabisa, passed through. Now, I, I have been looking forward to asking this question. Mm. If you could talk to a younger you, you know how you say, now, let's go back to that, that Mary looking at you now at 65, mm. hot, funky 65, what would you say? You know how you say, I wish I knew then what I know now. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could go back, but I look at all what has happened in life. And Do you I really say, want okay, to go no, back? I don't want to go back. <laughs> but honestly, Mwihaki, this is a question dear to my heart, and I impart it all the time, whether it's in my coaching, my emotional intelligence, my leadership coach to corporates, or even my full circle with Mary, or with my children who think I bore them to death. Honestly, the first thing is I would have invested mm-hmm. so that I have financial autonomy. Okay, there was, invest. Yeah, there are so many things I did. You know those nails I used to use? It used to be called Bogata, OPI, Bogata Color. I used to go to the hairdresser every Saturday, do my weave and look beautiful. And I had a friend who used to tell us, ah, nini munaenda kubank, eh? Munaenda kwa salon to bank. <laughs> <laughs> because you save a lot of money and we're given tea, a glass of wine. I do my pedicure, manicure, I do my hair. I was not saving a single shilling from my old age. I thought I'd reach, you know, meet a man, rich man, would live happily ever, ever after. after. And I had my BMW, had my wines, had my whiskey, had my credit card. And today I wish, I wish. There's so many people teaching about financial security, financial autonomy. I wish I had invested. I wish I had. And I, I heard this organization talking the other day on a radio, like listening to in the morning. So I was saying, don't wait to buy the plot of land or the house where you think you, you will love to live. You'll Start never reach fast. the money. You'll mm. never have the money at any one time. Start now. So, you know, buy something for, you know, property to build up your property base, which you will sell. I wish I had done that because I watched all my colleagues buying things in Buruburu, buying things in Kayole, buying, and I said, no, 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 me, I want to live where I was brought up, Westlands, wherever. <laughs> when it came to buy, it was 20 <laughs> years later. They had bought their first one, sold it, second one, sold it. They had the money to go and live in those kunas in Rundas. Mm. And me, I'm starting my first one, they're on their 10th one. So I would say, honestly, being wise to investing for your financial autonomy, because before you know it, like a twinkling of an eye, one day you're 30, you're 40, town, beautiful, riding your cars, and the next day you're 60 plus, And you don't know where that time went. So to me, I think women particularly, but in everybody anyway. Invest. That, invest, invest in yourself invest. because invest. you will need it. You will need to live the same standard of living. The second thing I would, ha- I would have told that younger Mary is please invest in relationships. I was all about work. I was Mrs. Atlas. Esso would you have carried died. the universe. I carried Esso. The whole lesson, if I was not here, it would have collapsed. I was working 16 hours. It was all about work. I used to tell people that 24 hours in a day, don't tell me you didn't finish the work. I don't care. And I did everything late. Got married late, got children late, got everything late. I'm not even sure if I was married, but anyway, everything late. <laughs> everything late. And relationships did not take time to build, whether within the family or friends. I see people with now children with children. So for me, invest in relationships. So we first was invest in finance, mm, invest in relationships. relationships. Yes, because work isn't everything. Work is a tool, it's a means. Unless you're very lucky that you have a vocation, I'm telling you, invest in relationships. Those are the things that will see you through to have a really what I'd call a, a, a balanced life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I would tell myself. Thank you very much. You know, we've had with us today on Emotional Intelligence Simplified, Mary Mkindia, who, oh, she has quite the story if you look through, but you hear her wisdom. Her wisdom is there, her love of life. But I think also things, don't you think as we wind up, things also happen when they should? Things happen when they should. I think I so, because otherwise I'll, you'll make me start thinking, hey, should I, would I, could I? No, and no, I can't change season. it. I there's think everything season. has a season. There's a season. But I like the wisdom of invest, 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 invest in those relationships because it's true and invest in finances. So please, we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts, your feedback. This is Emotional Intelligence. Looking forward to the next podcast.